Africans invented rubber. Now, I've said this before, but I don't want you to get confused. Yes, Africans invented rubber. The rubber in a car, on the tires, that rubber. Not they discovered sap and then Europeans galvanized. No, no, no. I'm talking about they took sap themselves, galvanized it through heat and other chemicals, and then they made balls, they made capes, they made shoes. And I will show you the proof from the 1500s written by a person who traveled to the kingdom of Congo and he details seeing this. Now keep in mind the word rubber didn't exist back then because in 1497, that was the first time Europeans saw rubber in the Americas. This guy went to Congo in the early 1500s, so he would have not understood what the substance he was looking at was called. A later guy will come in, and I'll talk about him, and he will detail seeing the rubber, but in the 1800s, when Europeans still hadn't tra traveled to Congo. In fact, Congo... And the route to Congo was called the white man's grave because not a lot of people or nobody really who tried to go as far deep as the Congo ever returned. This is due to the diseases, the land, the animals, and of course the people. Hostile was the nature of that area. So, let's get into the rubber. We start with Oxford. And Oxford says, the university, says, While natural rubber was indeed tapped, refined, and sold in Africa during, during the pre-colonial period until about 1800, its impact was negligible on the societies that dealt with it. During the late 19th century, rubber increasingly exercised considerable influence on Africa. So I want you to realize that the Europeans saw rubber for the first time in the Americas in the same century that the Europeans saw rubber in Africa. So there was no time to transfer or anything like that this was naturally or independently discovered in two regions of the world we know that the one in america goes back at least till 2000 bc but the one in africa is less known how far back it goes to remove all confusion i'll start with the one in the 1800s so it says at 5 p.m the great chief of urangi made his presence known by sounding his bell, a double iron gong. This gong consisted of two long iron bell-shaped instruments connected above by an iron handle, which when beaten with a short stick with a ball of Indian rubber at the end produced very agreeable musical sound. You can see the drumstick over here, which is made of so it's written drumsticks knobs being of indian rubber so you see it's got indian rubber at the tips wooden signal drum of wenya or wagenya and the tribes on the livingston now i want to remove a thought from you that you might have you might be thinking oh they traded it from india okay well let me remove that thought from you I want to remove something from your brain real quick. The book that is in question was published in 1875 and rubber in India was brought there in 1895 and was commercially available in 1902. So this book was published before India ever had rubber. When he says India rubber, he means Native American rubber. So this rubber was not brought here by anybody. It is native to the land. 
other places that mention rubber in the same book. Some of the natives, observing my anxiety to render her watertight, offered to bring me a substance which they said would be effectual for the purpose. In a few hours, they had brought me a mixture of Indian rubber and palm butter. We experimented with it instantly, but it was a very poor substitute for pitch, and I expressed my dissatisfaction with it. Going down, it says, Another valuable article of commerce besides the beeswax and Indian rubber found here was the gum copal. Not, however, amongst the possessions of the natives. We f were first attracted to it at Kalula Falls by the great quantities discovered between the rocks. One man collected about 50 pounds of it under the impression that he would be able, on reaching the coast, to sell it for a few peace. Poor fellow, he had but little idea of what was in store for him and all of us before we should arrive at the sea. The appearance of the substance proved that it had been long immersed in water. My opinion is that it is fossilized gum carried down by the Livingston River on Chiendo Island. A cake 15 pounds in weight was discovered besides many small pieces of two or three pounds weight of the mellow red and pale white variety. The babwende are too rich in palm oil to employ the gum, frankincense, and myrrh, and the other resins of the burasake as the warega and natives of Karuru do for lights. Of Indian rubber, the moa possess large quantities as their wooded ravines and the right slopes of the great river furnish them with inexhaustible supplies. One enterprising fellow carried one load of it to sell to the Bazombo, but he received so little cloth for it that he repented of the speculation. Now let's address what we just read. So firstly, he shows us drumsticks that show fully developed rubber that has been turned into a ball and put at the end of a stick, meaning that this is a very refined thing. And also to put it at the end of a stick and it not to just slip out, this is impressive. But secondly, we look that he says that one tribe has an exceeding a number of it, an almost inexhaustible number of rubber. And then one of the guys tried to sell it to another tribe, meaning that it's a trade substance within these people. They weren't selling it to the European. They were trying to sell it amongst each other. Now, to compare to places like Europe and the Americas. So the Americas, the Olmec, are called the Olmec. The word Olmec means the rubber people, right? And they were first discovered in the 1500s by the Europeans. Now, obviously, when I say discovered by the Europeans, I don't mean they were discovered because they discovered by the Europeans for the first time, first foreign people to come and see them. And they noticed that they had rubber. And just like they were noticed, these people noticed them. But when did the Americans or the Europeans finally use rubber well, for the Europeans, rubber, for the most part, was just a curiosity. And it really started getting a use when Priestley, in 1770, rubbed out pencil marks with it. And that's why we get the word rubber. That's its first use. The Indian part was, India part came from uh, Native Americans. Now, people who first saw the rubber 
and brought it back but did not bother to find out how it was made was Christopher Columbus and a French astronomer who in 1736 saw um, Native Americans who were using the rubber for shoes and cloaks. This is what rubber looks like in its natural state. You can't get to this without processing it. And of course, these guys processed it to some degree. I'm not exactly sure how they did it because I can't find the detail. But to turn it into a ball like that and have it be black or pitch is difficult. Uh, these natives were obviously aware of its waterproofing qualities, as you can see written down there, that when the European wanted his boat, because his boat was leaky, wanted it to be closed, the natives came with the Indian rubber and palm oil to try and seal the hole or the gap, the area that needed treatment. So now I'll read from the book from the 1400s, and you will be able to tell instantly that this is rubber, but this person is very ignorant of it. So I need to first tell you something. Uh, the rubber is extracted by cutting the outermost branch and then leaking out the latex so you don't get inside the branch. You just cut around the branch so you don't spoil it. It is done by making a cut in the branch of a tree and collecting the runny sap that comes out into the cup. In order to prevent the sap from solidifying, ammonia is added, acid is then added to the mix to extract the rubber in a process called coagulation. This mixture is then passed through rollers to remove excess water. That's just an explanation of how it works. Now, let's get to what they say in the 1500s about what they saw. Okay, so it says, A large tree called Enzanda grows here. It is always green and endowed with wonderful qualities as from its branches which spread upward descend others like threads and these forcing themselves into the earth and taking root. Other trees multiply in like manner inside the outermost bark of this tree. So listen to that. Inside the outermost bark of this tree, a substance is found which when cleaned and prepared for use, makes clothes for the poorest of the people. Now keep in mind that this is not bark cloth, because of course he knows what the, what the bark of a tree is. But he says there's a substance inside the outermost bark of the tree. So he doesn't know, he doesn't recognize the substance. He just knows that they use it. And of course, remember we read in the other one in the 1800s that this milky substance or the rubber, Indian rubber, is just so common as to be, un you, you couldn't even sell, he couldn't even sell it for one piece of cloth. And so interestingly, the rubber is worn by the poorest. But that wouldn't be a surprise if you consider the fact that he says, it must be remembered that gold, silver, and other metals are not valued nor used as money in these countries. And so it happens that with gold and silver in abundance, either in mats or in coin, yet nothing can be brought except with Lumache, in this island are seven or eight towns known in their language of the country of Libata, the principal one, called Il Santo Spirito, 
is where the governor resides. So you can see there it says that the th there's stuff like gold and silver and all of that, but then because it's so abundant, it's not even valued. And the rubber as well is, was probably so abundant, and it is, it is still is so abundant that it's resided as something for the poor, which you can understand why. Like rubber as clothing isn't very comfortable. Whereas the kings are wearing silks as it's written in other parts of the same book. But we're not talking about clothes. So I'll talk about that later. I want to say thank you to Min Ptah Hathor for donating $5. Uh, donating money does help in this channel as so far I've been doing it basically for free. Some of you are probably thinking, how can you say Congo was never penetrated before the 18th century and then say there was someone in the 15th century? Well, that's because there's two Congos. There's the Kingdom of Congo, which had Queen Nzinga, and this one was in Angola today. The Congo in question in the 1800s, which there was also rubber there, is inside. It's it's off the coast. It's in the central parts of Africa. It's this far area, not the coast, that was called the white man's grave or the dark continent because on maps it used to be dark because no one knew what that area was. So it would be called Ethiopia. It even was called Congo back then. It, like the name wouldn't have been called Congo by the natives. It was called Congo because that was the closest civilization they knew. Charles Goodyear in 1839 accidentally dropped some Indian rubber mixed with sulfur on a hot stove and discovered vulcanization in which after this he got a patent and the Europeans started using rubber more and more. Our final author who talks about the Congo and the rubber he saw there is David Livingston who was earlier than the other one from the 1800s, but later than the one from the 1500s. He said, The people seem to have no family names. A man takes the name of his mother, or should his father die, he may assume that. Marriage is forbidden to the first, second, and third degrees. They call first and second cousins brother and sister, a woman, after cupping her child's temple for sore eyes, threw the blood over the roof of her hut as a charm. In the above process, a goat's horn is used with a small hole in the pointed end. The base is applied to the part from which the blood is to be withdrawn, and the operator, with a small piece of chewed Indian rubber in his mouth, exhausts the air and at the proper moment plasters the small hole up with his tongue when the cupping horn is removed some cuts are made with a small knife and it is again applied as a rough appliance it is a very good one and in great repute everywhere <laughs> 